All right, my friends. Well, as I mentioned in the opening this morning, um, we're going to be diving in a little bit into understanding the New Testament today. And we're going to do that not only with some kind of basic building blocks of information, but then also looking at a couple of scriptures that kind of bring that all together. And so um, a couple of things to understand on the front end. The, the New Testament of the Bible, really, it's important to know, tells the story of real people struggling with real life. Right, we have um, first of all we have the the beginnings of are all about Jesus, and then it's all about the church becoming the church, becoming the people of God, growing in faith. And so, throughout the New Testament, we find um, people living their lives of faith, sometimes with great highs and also great lows. There are miracles and there are tragedies. Uh, there are blessings and there is suffering. Uh, people are trying to figure out, just like you and I, how do we do this life thing especially when sometimes life seems so chaotic, especially when sometimes life is so hard. Um, how do we faithfully live our lives of faith? The people in the Bible are, are asking those same questions. They're struggling with those same things. And we're going to see a, a, a specific example of that later this morning. But um, my hope then is, as we explore the New Testament today, that you can walk away with a better sense of, okay, now, first of all, it makes more sense to me what this collection of writings is all about but more importantly than that, I can, I can actually see these are real people, and it actually relates to my life. And so that's, that's what we're looking for here today. So I want to start with a picture of a bookshelf uh, that has all the books of the Bible. If you don't know, the Bible was not written at one time altogether. It's a collection of writings from different times and places. And the Old Testament of the Bible, that has 39 books, which is the top shelf and almost the whole second shelf. And the New Testament has 27 books, which starts with those four yellow ones. Everybody see the four yellow ones on the end of the second row? Those are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I think we know, if you know what those are called, say it with me. Those are the Gospels. They're called the Gospels because the word gospel means good news. The Gospels are biographies about Jesus. They tell us the good news of what God has done, is doing through Jesus Christ. The good news that Jesus came to die for us and save us. So the Gospels are about Jesus. They tell us the good news. Then the bottom shelf is the whole rest of the New Testament. Now, uh, notice these books are, are gathered in clumps and clusters. Uh, this is one particular way that we can cluster them together. You might see other people cluster them differently, but I find this to be a helpful clustering. Okay, so bottom row, one gray book, the book of Acts. Acts is a history book. Acts was written to help us understand what happened after Jesus was resurrected, how the church became a church, how the Christian faith became a faith of a bunch of people in different places. And so the book of Acts starts right there in Jerusalem after Jesus was resurrected. We got the story of Pentecost uh, where the Holy Spirit comes. And then we have the early church first starting there. And then there's a ripple effect as the church spreads out from Jerusalem. So the book of Acts tells this story about how it unfolded, okay? Now, the rest of that bottom row, the blue and the red, are letters. Okay, the Greek word for that is epistle. That's a funny word, but sometimes you might hear it, the word epistle, so we might say Paul's epistles. We mean Paul's letters. They're letters, okay? And what you need to understand is that these letters were personal writings written to people and places, communities where there was real relationship. So these aren't just random things that were put out there for people to hear about. They were written to specific people from a specific person. The blue ones were all written by Paul. Now, it wasn't that many weeks ago we heard the story of Paul again. Remember, his name was Saul. He became Paul. He was this, hor he was this hateful man who um, got, got transformed by Christ and became the greatest missionary in the history of the, of the Christian faith. So Paul wrote a whole bunch of letters, and here's what would happen. And so Acts tells us about this, and then these letters um, bring in the relational part. So Paul would go someplace, and he would, he would help start a Christian community. And then when he went on from there to another place, he would write a letter back to those folks to say, hey, checking in, how you doing? Hey, I heard you have this question. Here's how I think about it. And it, it was in personal response to this community that he had helped to build. Okay, and so I'll give you an example of that here in a moment. But I want to tell you, the rest of those books, then the red ones, those are letters that were written by some other people. So Peter wrote some of those. John wrote some of those. Um, they were um, written by 
other early disciples other than Paul, okay? So basic idea right there of the New Testament, we have the Gospels, we have Acts, which is the history book, and then we have a series of letters that were written. Now, over time, all of these different books of the Bible and these letters were, were kept by Christian communities, and they were passed down. And so we have them going all the way back. Um, and the letter we're going to read today, um, 1 Thessalonians, was written in about the year 50 A.D., okay? So somewhere around, let's say, 18 years or so after Jesus died, um, this letter was written. And so we're going to find out some more information around that here in a, in a minute. But let's go ahead and go to the next um, slide, and I'll show you something. So this is a map of Paul's second missionary journey, and we're going to talk more in detail in a moment. But um, in Paul's ministry, he took three main uh, missionary journeys where he went around the Mediterranean and helped to start Christian churches. And so if you can see the yellow star in the bottom corner, that's Jerusalem, okay? And that's kind of the epicenter where it all started. And then the red line shows kind of the route of travel to different times and places. Now, today we're going to land at the um, purple star Thessalonica. It's a great Greek name, isn't it? Thessalonica is there in Macedonia. It's part of the, it was part of the Roman Empire, but they were a Greek city, okay? And later, after Paul left Thessalonica, he wrote a letter back to them that we still have today called First Thessalonians. Have you heard that, Thessalonians? Okay, it comes from the letter he wrote to the people in Thessalonica. So the book of Acts tells us about his trip to Thessalonica. The letter, um, the first Thessalonians letter, is Paul writing back to those people later. And so we have the connection of here's the history of what happened, and now here's the personal relationship Paul relating to these people. So a couple other places on there, you see the city of Corinth. That's where later we have the letters of First and Second Corinthians. We also see the red star is Ephesus. We have the letter to the Ephesians, okay? If you remember some of the other books in the Bible, right, there's Romans. That was a letter written to the Christians in Rome, okay? Uh, and um, Romans. Oh, it's not on there. The rest of them aren't on there. It's not on there, yeah. yeah. So, at, you did, so I'd have to show you more. I didn't even tell you where we're looking if you don't know. I, I like maps. I have maps in my head. I know not everybody does. So, um, so what you're looking at, the bottom of the, of the page there is Africa, okay? That's Af the continent of Africa is at the bottom. If we were to go off the screen to your left, uh, you would find uh, Italy is just beyond there, okay? But right now we're looking at Greece on that side. And the main part of the screen where it says Asia, that's modern-day Turkey, where it says Asia, modern-day Turkey, okay? Does that give you enough of the groundwork? Okay, great. So let's go ahead and move into the reading today, and we'll kind of try to unpack some of this. What I, what I want you to hear then is, uh, in the book of Acts, we have this incredible history of how the, the good news about Jesus became a faith that was spread ultimately across the world, but it started in Jerusalem and had this ripple effect that went out. Now, last week, you may remember, um, we were with Peter and James, and it was right at the beginning of the Christian movement. And so, do you remember the story? Peter went to the temple, and there was a lame man, and this incredible healing happened, right? Okay. That was at the very beginning, um, early on after Jesus was resurrected and ascended. Now, we pick up the story today, um, a number of years later, as Paul has come onto the scene, and he now is, this, is taking the message uh, all across the Mediterranean world, Okay. And so in a very real way, we're moving away from the first generation to the second generation of believers, okay? We're, we're seeing the torches pass now from the people who knew Jesus in person to the next generation of people who are having the story passed on to them. So here we go, um, Paul's journey to Thessalonica. Paul and Silas then traveled through the towns of Amphipolis and Apollonina and came to Thessalonica where there was a Jewish synagogue. As Paul's custom, as was Paul's custom, he went to the synagogue service, and for three Sabbaths in a row, he used the scriptures to reason with the people. He explained the prophecies and proved that the Messiah must suffer and rise from the dead. He said, this Jesus I'm telling you about is the Messiah. Now, some of the Jews who listened were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas along with many God-fearing Greek men and quite a few prominent women. Okay, pause here. 
So now we get a little insight into Paul's approach. Okay, so as he went from community to community, the first place he went was to the Jewish community. Paul was Jewish. Okay, Paul, um, that was his ancestry, that was his culture, that was his faith. Remember, um, the first Christians, the very first Christians, were all Jewish folks who believed that Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah that the Jewish people had always been waiting for, right? And so, um, so Paul holds this faith dear to him, and these people, these are his people. So he first would go to the synagogue, to the Jewish community, and as we read over a number of um, Sabbaths, he would teach them using the Old Testament scriptures, that's all they had at the time, and he would say, look at how these prophecies point to Jesus. I'm here to tell you that these prophecies have been fulfilled. The Messiah has come. He's given his life for us all. And that's where he would start with, with his work. And as he'd start to build a community with those people, it would spread out from there to others in the community. And so we read here that other God-fearing Greek men and prominent women in the community of Thessalonica um, become a part of this early Christian community. So something is happening, something's forming. Now what I want you to hear and understand here is Paul then is functioning as the pastor for this church, okay? He is teaching these people all about Jesus. He's raising them up in the faith. He's helping them um, to come to know who God is. And as they are filled and empowered with the Spirit, this Christian community is taking form. Now, as happens in most of the places that Paul goes, not everyone in town appreciates this new religion popping up. Okay, not everybody thinks this is a good thing or a good idea. It causes problems. And so now we're going to see what happens in this next part of the reading. But some of the Jews were jealous. So they gathered some troublemakers from the marketplace to form a mob and start a riot. They attacked the home of Jason, searching for Paul and Silas so they could drag them out to the crowd. Not finding them there, they dragged out Jason and some of the other believers instead and took them before the city council. Paul and Silas have caused trouble all over the world, they shouted, and now they're here disturbing our city too. And Jason has welcomed them into his home. They are all guilty of treason against Caesar, for they profess allegiance to another king named Jesus. The people of the city, as well as the city council, were thrown into turmoil by these reports. So the officials forced Jason and other believers to post bond, and then they released them. Okay. So here we're reading from the book of Acts, a historical um, background of Paul's visit to Thessalonica, okay? Now, there's some more information. If we would continue this reading, you'd hear some more about it. Long story short, Paul and Silas have to leave town. They got to get out of there, all right? So you can see that this, that all of a sudden, there's an uproar in the city. People are mad about this situation, and things are tense. So this mob has been formed. They've gone to Jason's home. Jason was a, a, a new believer in Jesus who had welcomed Paul and Silas into his home. The mob goes there. Paul and Silas aren't there. So they drag Jason out instead and some of the other early believers, and they bring them before the city council. And you can imagine this mob just, they, you know, they, they want blood, right? These people are out. They're out for blood. They are angry. They are upset. And remember, Thessalonica, while it's a Greek city, Right? They're under Roman occupation. And so um, one thing that they need to make sure, the, the city leaders, they need to keep the peace. What the Romans want is peace. And if the city leaders can't keep the peace, then the Romans are going to come in and do something about it. So the city leaders are all about appeasing the crowd. they got to keep everybody happy. And so whatever it takes to keep the crowd happy, they're going to do. Right, so in this situation we hear they, they allow Jason and his friends to post bond for now. But it's clear from what's happening, it's not a safe place for Paul and Silas to be. All right? So imagine the situation. Paul and Silas have been ministering to these people. They've been pastoring them. They've been raising them in the faith. These are still new believers in Jesus. And they're figuring out what it means to be Christian. And all of a sudden, um, they've got all this persecution coming at them. You can ima- I mean, imagine if you were Jason and his family. From now on, you are petrified because you know any day the crowd could come back to your house again and it could be a lot worse. Okay, these people are living in fear. Now, if, if you're Jason and his family, you might probably be tempted to think, you know, um, this might just be a lot easier for us all if we just kind of forget this Jesus thing and go back to what we were doing before, right? That would make things a lot simpler. 
Now, what's amazing about all these early Christian communities they, that suffered severe persecution is that they persevered in their faith. And the reason for that, my friends, is not, is not just because they thought it was a cool new idea. The persecution was, was severe and real. And so as they're struggling, what's happening is these people have been empowered by the Spirit. They have come to know that God is a living God. They know that Jesus is their Messiah. They believe that. It's not a fad. It's not something they're trying out. They really believe it. They know it. And so they're going to persevere despite the persecution. So we're going to um, now jump into the letter that Paul writes to them so um, we can understand then um, some more of these details. So let's go back to the bookshelf again. Okay, so we were on the gray book, Acts, right? We got the history. Now from there, Paul travels. He has to leave, but he's going to write a letter later. He's going to write a letter back to them. So now we're pulling out one of the blue books off the shelf, 1 Thessalonians. And this is the first letter that Paul wrote to them. Let's go to the map. So you see the purple star is Thessalonica. That's where we just were. Okay, from there, Paul travels down the coast of Macedonia. Um, he stops at other places, and he lands in Corinth. All right? Blue star. Blue star. Your left. There you go. Yes. Started at the purple. Now they're at the blue. Right? So now Paul is in Corinth. Now here's the thing. If you're Paul, what's weighing on your heart right now? The people in Thessalonica. And of course, the other places that he's been along the way. Understand that he has real relationships with these people, right? He sat in their homes and he's prayed with them. He's seen the Holy Spirit poured out upon them. He's witnessed them persevere in their faith. So one of the first things he does when he's in Corinth is he sends one of his assistants, a man named Timothy, Anybody hear about 1st and 2nd Timothy in the Bible? Okay, Timothy was kind of one of his protégés. So Paul sends Timothy back to Thessalonica to check in with those people, all right? After he's there for a little while, he comes back to Corinth. Michelle, you're doing a great job. Thank you. <laughs> he, come, he comes, she's got a finger spell Thessalonica every time I say it. Thessalonica, Thessalonica. She's smart, isn't she? I thought I was going to be funny. Just Thessalonica, Thessalonica, Thessalonica. Okay. So while Paul is here in Corinth, he writes a letter to the church back in Thessalonica because he's worried about them. He's thinking about them. Timothy has come back and given him a report about how they're doing. So what I want you to, again to see here is these are real people in real places struggling with their faith, trying to figure out how to do this. So let's go to Thessalonians and read a little bit here, okay? So this letter, remember we said it's an epistle, it's a letter. This letter is from Paul, Silas, and Timothy. We are writing to the church in Thessalonica, to you who belong to God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. May God give you grace and peace. We always thank God for all of you and pray for you constantly as we pray to our God and Father about you. We think of your faithful work, your loving deeds, and the enduring hope you have because of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, pause there. Now, now that you've heard the backstory and we're connecting the dots, do you see the personal nature of this letter? Do you see that Paul is writing to people that, that he cares about, people that he knows, people that are weighing on his heart and mind, people he's concerned for? He wants them to know that he is praying for them, that he has not forgotten them, that um, he is thinking about them constantly. Okay, you, you hear that, don't you? Now he continues, and this is the last part that we'll read today. He says, We know, dear brothers and sisters, that God loves you and has chosen you to be his own people. For when we brought you the good news, it was not only with words, but also with power. For the Holy Spirit gave you full assurance that what we said was true. And you know of our concern for you from the way we lived when we were with you. So you received the message with joy from the Holy Spirit in spite of the severe suffering it brought you. In this way, you imitated both us and the Lord. As a result, you have become an example to all the believers in Greece throughout both Macedonia and Achaia. Okay, we'll stop the reading there. Now, if you're curious about how the rest of this goes... 
When you go home, look up First Thessalonians this week. The story continues. The letter continues, okay? We'll stop there today. So I love this verse, though, verse 4, what he says to them. He says, We know, dear brothers and sisters, that God loves you and has chosen you to be his own people. All right, he's writing back to remind them to think back to when he first got there and all that unfolded in their relationship together, that they became certain as they were filled with the Holy Spirit that Jesus loved them, that God loved them, that they were God's people. This good news for all of us, that God loves us and God chooses us. And once again, you hear the pastoral nature of this letter to them, don't you? And then he, he goes on to say, so you receive the message with joy from the Holy Spirit in spite of the severe suffering it brought you. Now, folks, I can't say loudly enough um, what's going on here for these people? I mean, you know, in many ways, we sort of take for granted in our culture that we can, we can choose whatever faith we want to choose or not. You know, we can choose how much we want to follow it or not. It's all by choice, and there's really no repercussions, right? These people are choosing to follow Jesus despite the fact that it's bringing them suffering. Despite the fact that by choosing to follow Jesus, they have to sometimes live in fear. They face persecution. And for me, what that bring, really makes clear is that this isn't just a nice idea that they decided to go along with. They didn't just think Paul was a nice guy with, with some cool things to teach them. right? This wasn't just some fad that they tried out for a little while. Clearly, the Holy, their, their experience with the Holy Spirit was so profound that they had no choice but to acknowledge the reality of who God is and what he had done for them. Jesus was their Messiah. They knew it. And despite the suffering, they clung to that faith. So you have this early Christian community that's been formed by the power of the Spirit. They are under persecution and suffering, but they are in it together. They are living this faith together. And notice what Paul reminds them of. Listen, when you suffer... You are imitating, he says, you're imitating me and you're imitating the Lord, right? Because Paul, if you, read, if you read the whole book of Acts, you see that Paul suffers immensely for the gospel. I mean, he gets run out of town after town after town, and some places he endures incredible suffering um, because of his witness to Jesus. And he says, not only do you imitate me, but you imitate the Lord. And as we know, our Lord and Savior Jesus went through incredible suffering, the most humiliating kind uh, and painful death. What Paul's reminding all of us, my friends, is that when we suffer, we don't suffer alone. Even if we think we're alone, we are never alone. In our suffering, we are in solidarity with Jesus Christ. Our Lord knows what it's like to suffer. He knows what it's like to be humiliated. He knows what it's like to be betrayed and backstabbed. He knows what it's like to die. And Paul reminds them that they are not alone in their suffering. Now, as we wrap all this up, what I want us to see at the end of this as we talk about how these are real people in real life figuring out how to live their faith. Notice that they are doing this in community. They are doing this together. Right? If these folks in Thessal Thessalonica practice their faith like is so popular in our culture today, right? Uh, my faith is a personal thing to me and I do it on my own. Do you think they would have been able to hold to it? The kind of suffering and persecution they endured? I, don't, I doubt it. I doubt it. But they stuck together. They encouraged each other. They lifted each other up. They endured and persevered together. And Paul came alongside them. Paul supported them. Paul encouraged them. Paul was with them. And that's what we see Paul doing here, bottom line, is he is encouraging them in their faith. I want to ask you to stop for a moment and think about your story. And who are the encouragers in your faith? Who are the people who um, have encouraged you to persevere in your faith? Who have those people been? And let's just, take, let's just take a few moments here to reflect on one, two, or three people who have been those main encouragers for you. Just 
Folks, I want you to keep in mind that as you persevere in your faith, you, you also honor those people, don't you? And you honor what they've poured into you. And as we try to do life together here, as we try to be the church, we're reminded that we're not just a collection of individuals doing our own thing. We are a community that's been called together by Christ, a community that's bound together by the Holy Spirit. And when we do this life together, it means that we are especially here not only to celebrate the highs, but also to walk with each other through the lows, to support and to encourage. But that happens in relationship which means we also have to be intentional about building relationship. We can't be a community unless we create community, right? Now, isn't that also what we are endeavoring to do here in even much bigger ways? That's, for me, one of, part of what's so incredible about what we are joining in together here as we celebrate our grand opening this next Saturday. Not only are we a church community right here together, but we are opening this place to the wider community so that people from all walks of life have a place where they know they can come to be, a place where they can connect, a place where community happens. God has called us to build and create a community center because people need community. They need relationship. And at a time when people are suffering, they need a place where they can go to connect with people who will walk with them. So friends, as you've reflected on the people who have encouraged you in the faith, now I ask you, and who are you encouraging? Who are you walking with? Who are you coming alongside of? That's what we're all tasked with and called to do. We walk with one another. We encourage one another. That requires vulnerability on both parts. That requires authenticity and honesty. Those things can be very hard to come by sometimes. But that's what real community does. Now, if you're wondering, how can we do all of these things? Well, I want to point you back to the scriptures. As we just saw today, the book of Acts tells us this incredible history. But then all of those letters that follow bring to life the real people and the real relationships that existed in those places. These are people that had to fight for their faith. And they sometimes got it really wrong. Okay? Many times in Paul's letters, he also has to say to them, so guys, we need to talk about something here because this thing you're doing, it's not okay. It doesn't honor God. Right? In his letter to the Corinthians, he has to say, what you're doing with communion isn't okay. You need to, you need to, you need to fix that. Some of the things you're doing when you gather and worship, that's, that doesn't honor God. You need to fix that. And sometimes we have to help steer each other in the right direction, right? Sometimes we need to do that. But we're on this journey together, and we are called to encourage, to uplift, to support. And just like those in Thess Thessalonica did, we persevere together. Let's pray. Oh, gracious Lord, we thank you for the witness that we find in the scriptures that reminds us that we are never alone that you are with us always, especially in our suffering. But we thank you, God, for the gift of community, that you call us to gather together to support, to encourage, and to walk alongside one another. God, may we continue to invite your spirit to fill us each day, to empower us in our faith, and to encourage us to lift up one another as we share your good news with those around us. God, we pray that you guide us in this, in this church, that we would bless our community, God, that we would continue to invite in all those, Lord, who need support, who need encouragement, who need someone to walk with them. Thank you for your grace and mercy. May we honor you in all that we do. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things.